Well, hello, good people of YouTube. Welcome back to this channel. Welcome back to my 2004 Mark I Audi TT. Lots of you have been asking over the past, well, month or so since this is featured on the channel, what happened to the car? Because the way we left it is it scraped through its MOT and, and that was it. But I do still have the car and I do still have the XC90 of which many of you are looking forward to more videos with becoming very, very soon. But I have still got this car, which is a complete surprise to me. In fact, the entire car was a complete surprise. If you don't know what I'm talking about, click up here, go and watch the first video I did with this car where I revealed that essentially I bought this accidentally. I mean, it genuinely was a complete accident. It was never part of my plan to have an Audi TT, nor had I really ever been interested in one. But the reason I'm making today's video talking about whether you should buy one of these cars is because it has truly surprised me. I think in the past few years of cars I've owned, and there's probably 10 to 15 cars, I've never been so surprised and in a good way as well. So I really just wanna shout about that today and make this video, but also discuss whether it could be a good purchase for you because actually you can get good examples of these for less than two grand. This one cost me 800 quid and I would argue it's absolutely brilliant. But there's nothing that I can really think of for that sort of price point that affords you such style, a good badge, good performance, practicality as well. And it's extremely cheap to run, which is why for the past well, few months since I've had this car, I've actually been using this as my daily driver. When the Audi TT was launched, well, last millennium, I think there was a bit of a reputation going around that TT stood for total because that's what you'd have had to be to buy one. They were pretty expensive and they were just very different actually. Nothing really had come out before that, that looked like this. But now that they're so much more affordable, obtainable and extremely small compared to everything else that's on the road, I think that TT abbreviation has changed somewhat and potentially doesn't mean what I just said. And so being put off buying one of these things because you didn't want to be seen as a flashy git and spending so much money on this latest sports car, it's never really a problem anymore. In fact, this is probably the least flashy car that I've ever owned or, or driven. And so that's really not a problem. It's extremely understated. When you think about getting into the Mark 1 TT, it looks like you'd be trying to fit an elephant into an envelope because of its small size. But despite that, inside, it really doesn't feel like that at all. I think that's largely helped by the fact that you've got two rear seats in the back instead of, I don't know, a board partitioning that from the boot. And also the front here is this flat table-like surface, which gives you the impression that it goes on forever. But then very quickly after that, the bonnet falls away from you and the rear of the car does the same. So it is a small car, but the interior space is sort of 70% of it, or at least it feels like that. There's never a problem with headroom because of this sort of beetle-like bubble shape. And you can get into a really comfortable driving position, even if you're really tall, which I'm really not. The interior in and of itself, and I've talked about this previously, is extremely special. I can't really put it any other way. There's so many styling cues, like these silver rings, which all have the same amount of holes in them. You see them absolutely everywhere in the car. The dials themselves, very minimalistic, very Audi of this era, very nice to look at. And just all of the switch gear and the buttons that you touch, especially these heated seat buttons, which pop out and twist, they just feel extremely expensive. My favorite thing of all though, is probably this TT cover that you can put to hide the radio away. Something I wish was in more cars, especially modern ones, when they've got these huge ghastly screens on them. I wish you could just do something like Bentley do now to hide them away. So I love that. And there really is nothing more than you need in this car. It's, it's perfectly balanced. Before this, I've had a BMW Z4. I've had a Mark II Mazda MX-5. I've also owned a 986 Porsche Boxster. And none of them quite do the interior as well as this. The closest it probably gets is the Boxster with its beautiful carpets all around. Then the Z4, then maybe the MX-5. But the TT definitely stands out on top. It's really quirky in here and not like anything else I've ever had before. Another thing for me that the Mark 1 TT has over those aforementioned cars, the MX-5, Boxster and Z4, is its rear load space. Although having said that, it doesn't benefit from the novelty of the Boxster's front boot. That always feels kind of cool opening it, although you're quite acutely aware that you look like a bit of a knobhead. But anyway, this thing has this quirky 
rear load space, which opens up. I don't know why it reminds me of sort of like a Porsche Cayenne with that glass dividing screen that opens up, but this is it, the only entrance to the boot. And it reveals this pretty big space, which you can very easily make even bigger by folding down these rear seats. Makes me feel like it's a sort of Audi TT van. Now, don't quote me on capacity numbers over those other cars I've mentioned, but this one feels like you're gonna be able to get the most in it. It's certainly the best car out of the four for trips to the garden center or potentially to the airport. And perhaps the best thing of all is that this thing is fantastically cheap to run. It will certainly blow the Boxster and the Z4 out of the water in terms of running costs. For example, the tires are these extremely thin things and would only cost about 80 to 100 pounds a corner if you went for the nice ones. The road tax is less than 400 pounds on this 1.8 model, which by today's standards is perfectly acceptable. The fuel economy too is really impressive. It tells me that I average around 34 or 35 miles per gallon, but it feels like so much more than that. In fact, today is the first time I've ever actually filled up the tank with fuel. Normally, half the tank gives me enough to last a week or two. Now I did fill it up today, did a bit of an experiment with the prices as they are, £1.42 a litre at the moment. It costs just over 70 quid to fill up and that apparently will give me 400 miles, which I just think is very, very impressive. The Boxster and the Z4 mm, wouldn't really get near that. MX-5 with the 1.8 engine, probably not. As soon as you take it on a motorway, it would really struggle to maintain any sort of economy at 70 miles per hour. But this thing just does so well and I think this engine is incredible at not really laboring itself. You can be in fifth gear at 30 miles an hour without any problems whatsoever. It really doesn't mind it. And not to mention, at least in my case, this thing only costs 800 pounds. I've managed to get it through an MOT and I've literally spent zero on it. The only money I've actually spent is getting that airbag reader to reset the airbag light, which is back on by the way. But that was literally 26 quid. It's not needed anything else in terms of maintenance or, or keeping it on the road. Now, if at this point of the review you're sold and already looking at Auto Trader for your Mark 1 Audi TT, well then do stay tuned because there's a few things when it comes to the driving experience which may yet put you off. But very quickly, before we go into those, here's a quick message from today's video sponsor. Thank you to HelloFresh for sponsoring today's video. They are the reason that this week I've got some absolutely delicious meals that have been delivered straight to my door. HelloFresh is an incredibly useful service. If you're someone like me that's out and about all the time, doesn't always have time to get ingredients in and also doesn't know all that much about cooking because you go on the website, choose from differing and hundreds of menu options, and then they're delivered straight to your door with instructions like this and all of the ingredients packaged and numbered and labeled so that you know exactly what you need to create your meal. It makes life very easy, particularly when you're not at home much and you will never get bored either because like I say, the items on the menu change every single week. Now Katie and I have already cooked two delicious meals this week. One was a chicken schnitzel dish and the other a gorgeous, very, very luxurious bacon mac and cheese. But this one is probably the one I've been most excited for and I've waited till last. I'm sure it's gonna be lovely. It's this beautiful halloumi burger. So that's gonna be tonight. But like I say, didn't have to go to a supermarket to get any of this stuff. It came straight to me and it's just so, so convenient and easy. Now, if you want to try HelloFresh, you've heard about it a lot and you've never actually had a go, you can now try with my amazing code below and in the description, get 60% off your first box and then another 25% off your next eight. It's a fantastic deal. I really encourage you to check it out and take advantage of it. All the details on screen and below in the description. Thanks so much, HelloFresh. Let's get back to the TT. So once you jump in the TT and get behind the wheel, then you're presented with this sort of chirpy, fun-loving driving experience. But there's a few things I'm gonna complain about. But before I do complain, don't comment saying, no, oh, but it only cost you 800 quid, so you can't really complain about anything because if it cost 800 quid to have Susan Boyle around for the night, you wouldn't necessarily do it without asking any questions, would you? But joking aside, it is a fantastic package, this Mark 1 TT, this being the 1.8 litre front wheel drive, 180 horsepower version, probably one of the rarest ones you could get. Most of them are Quattro, but I do like this front wheel drive for a number of reasons. There are ways in which it falls short though, compared to its competitors, so to speak. The number one for me has to be the gearbox. Now, it only has five gears, which is a bit of a disadvantage anyway, because six would be better for noise levels and fuel economy. 
it doesn't really struggle with those two things anyway, but it is just in the throw itself. There's no way after a thousand miles of driving this car so that you can really do fast or particularly smooth gear changes. It always feels a little bit cumbersome to use and a little bit challenging. It almost feels like this gearbox is slightly working against you, whereas especially with that BMW manual that was in my Z4, completely the opposite. One of the nicest throws I've still experienced. But truth be told, the way that this engine performs with all of its torque, you don't really need to use the gears that much. You can quite literally drive around in fifth gear from 15 or 20 miles per hour to whatever the top speed is. The pedal placement makes it difficult to heel and tow as well. The brake and the throttle are quite far apart from each other. So doing a downshift whilst braking and adding some power, it's not impossible, but it's again, not as intuitive as in the Porsche, the MX-5, or even the BMW. Now this four cylinder engine is never going to sound as good as the Boxster or the Z4 with a six cylinder engine, but the Mark I does have an answer to that, 3.2 V6, which is famously in the R32 Golf, which is a car that the values have gone up massively in. You can get that engine in one of these Mark Ones. Some say it's a little bit overpowered and actually a bit front heavy with that engine. I'm yet to experience it, but it does sound fantastic. Having said that, this 1.8 does have some merit. It has a really nice dump sound when you come off the power if you're in boost. It will be hard to demonstrate it on camera because it is rather quiet and piddly, but it does make a fun sound, especially when you're lower down in the RPMs and you come on and off the boost. It's quite fun. Performance-wise, on paper, it's much slower than the Boxster and the Z4 with the three liter and the 3.2 liter engines, but it doesn't feel it. And I've said this before in, in previous videos, so if you have watched all of the episodes with this car, I do apologize, but it, it just has a way of feeling a lot quicker than it is. It really outperforms itself. Now I must get this thing on a dyno, and in fact, if you are a dyno company watching or know of someone with a dyno that would be willing to collaborate with me on a video, I would love to get this on a dyno and see what it's actually producing. Because it is meant to be 180 horsepower, I don't really believe it's had more added to it or it's been remapped, but it just feels quicker. Now I wonder if partly that's due to this being a front wheel drive version, because inherently, when you stick a bunch of power through the front wheels, the car does bounce around and respond quite a lot quicker than if it was a rear wheel drive car. And that might add to the whole drama of the acceleration and contribute to making it feel faster than it is. But I certainly am never driving along. I'm never driving along in this car, actually, despite all of the really fast cars I do get to experience. I'm never driving along in this wanting for more power. I, I genuinely mean that. It's such a versatile little engine as well, because like I say, you can use fifth gear at almost any speed. We're doing 30 miles per hour now, it's dead silent. We're tickling over at around 12, 50, 1300 RPM. The engine's not having any issues whatsoever. In fact, if I put my foot down, it's almost right there in the boost already. But also you've then got second gear, which you can be in from around five, 10 miles per hour. And if you plant it, if I keep going and going and going, we're almost at 70 miles an hour if I went all the way to the top to the red line, which is just remarkable. What about the handling though? Is it as communicative as a Porsche Boxer? No, nowhere near. And of course it doesn't have that mid-engined balance either. Is it as communicative as an MX-5? Well, absolutely not. The Nardi steering wheel I had on the 1.8 MB MX-5, which was my dad's actually, it was gorgeous to, to use and, and the steering was so direct on that car. The Z4 though is probably on par with that. Z4 has a bit of a challenging electronic rack on it, which suffers from various sticky steering problems, which my car was a little bit played with. It wasn't the most communicative of handling cars, but this TT is probably on par with that. It's not the best, but it's certainly not the worst. I think I'd like the steering wheel to be a bit smaller as well. I suppose if I had it retrimmed in Alcantara, it would feel nicer, but it, it does feel a little bit too big. I'd like it to be a bit smaller. But then because it has these tiny little skinny tires and it's front wheel drive, if you go slightly too fast, 
round a roundabout, and I mean slightly, that was 25 miles per hour, a perfectly reasonable speed, you get the thing screeching its nuts off. So where it falls down a little bit in dynamic capability and maybe performance, it really, really makes up for it in character. I mean, across the board, just from putting fuel in the car and popping down the filler cap to making it screech round roundabouts, it's got bucket loads of character, this car. And that's what has surprised me the most with this TT. I thought with the Audi badge, I immediately would just dismiss it as being a little bit sobering, a little bit dull, a little bit monotone, black and white, if you like. But it, it's really not. It's completely, completely the opposite. And maybe that's been helped with time because we live in a world now of electronics and big screens and stability control this and torque vectoring that. But the TT, the Mark I at least, is back to basics. It's stripped back. And it's a real true gem of an example of a time when cars were designed and made with the drivers in mind and not marketing teams in mind. It's truly a special car that I think is grossly undervalued. So I won't leave you pondering on the question yourself of should you buy a Mark 1 TT because the answer is absolutely yes. I can categorically, strongly say that. And I, I really do recommend you buy one of these cars. Even if you've got a couple of cars already, just get this, have a third car. They're so cheap to buy, they're even cheaper to run and they really punch above their weight in smiles that they give you for the amount of money you pay. It is therefore the most surprising car I've, I've ever owned and it'll be a tricky one to sell this. It's one of those weird cases of it was so cheap but I've added some value to it and I could probably make some money on this thing but at the same time it was so cheap so I should just run it until it breaks. I haven't quite made my mind up on that but every time I do drive this car I think well there's no way I'm going to sell it. It's just too much fun. So there's my take on the Mark 1 TT there. And as you can see, I'm besotted with this thing. I think it's fantastic, especially for the money. Is there better value out there? I'm not sure. But do comment below and prove me wrong if you think there is. And if you're a Mark 1 TT owner as well, let me know if you agree with all the points I've made. Thanks all so much for watching. There's more content coming with the XC90 over the next few weeks. So if you've been following that series, you'll be looking forward to that, I'm sure. It's a very interesting car, that one. But thank you all so much for watching this one and I'll see you very, very soon. Another thing for me that the TT hat, f***ing hell, f***ing wasp flew.